Season 6, Episode 12 of The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch is one of those installments that feels equal parts field science and mystery thriller, and the episode wastes no time piling up strange. Cross. Check data. The team follows a thread that began weeks earlier when drill bits were shredded and odd ceramic fragments showed up in drilling spoils. In this episode, the investigators bring boreholes, cameras, ground, penetrating radar, magnetometers, gamma detectors, and lab gear together in a focused push to learn what exactly is buried in the mesa. The tone of the episode is methodical and excited D. The crew is cautious about making wild claims, but every time independent instruments point at the same place, the excitement grows. You watch a group of practical scientists and technicians who are used to messy data get increasingly intrigued as multiple independent signals converge on the same depth and location inside the MESA. What makes this episode striking is how many different techniques point to the same target zone roughly between 240 and 280 feet down. The team recovered a 1964 nickel in the drilling spoils and used that clue to search archival aerial photos, which raised questions about a missing set of images from the mid-1960s. That historical curiosity frames the rest of the show T. If someone was digging there in the 1960s, what did they see, and why would photos be missing? The modern work answers that by showing a mapped anomaly consistent across GPR, magnetometry, and physical drill resistance. The GPR rundown borehole 1 shows a distinct off axis structure roughly 12 feet from the hole and about 6 feet thick. Sam DeRiso's magnetometer run confirms strong magnetic spikes in the same depth range, and the borehole camera footage from borehole 2 captured flashes that the team interprets as energetic particle strikes, perhaps gamma rays. When several instruments that rely on different physics all single out the same place, the probability that this is a real physical anomaly goes way up. Drilling and casing the boreholes is a big part of the episode's drama. The crew tries to finish borehole 2 and then works hard on reopening and casing borehole 1 so they can safely send instruments down. Both operations hit a stubborn hard spot that chews up drill bits and damages cutting teeth in ways that don't match normal geology. The team describes the bit as being nearly welded to the drill rod at times and notes unexpected thermal effects without corresponding temperature readings. Those mechanical problems are not presented as spooky storytelling. Instead, the show treats them as data, the patterns of tool failure, damage, and the locations where issues occur become measurable evidence that something unusual is present. The result is a practical sense of urgency. They need to case the hole and get their sensor sleds and cameras in place before they lose access. And the drilling mechanics provide tension that feels like a real expeditional problem. The borehole camera footage itself is a standout sequence. When the drillers ran a camera down into borehole 2 around 240 feet, they captured sudden, brief flashes in the dark that the team suggests could be gamma ray hits on the camera focal plane. Those flashes are short and not visually spectacular in the way a movie would dramatize them, but the team treats them seriously because gamma rays are measurable physical events and because the flashes align in time and location with other anomalies. That footage pushes the group to treat the MESA not as a passive rock formation, but as a site emitting energetic phenomena. In response, they quickly pivot instead of continuing with the original plan to aggressively bore through. They stop and bring in non destructive scanning tools to map and characterize the object before further physical disturbance. 
the use of archival research and the 1964 nickel is a clever journalistic and scientific thread in the episode. Team archaeologist Chris Roberts explains that archaeologists sometimes bury coins to mark the date of a dig, and the unexpected presence of a 1964 nickel in drill spoils prompts the team to hunt for records and photos from that era. They find aerial imagery that seems to be missing or altered for the mid-1960s and then use an AI algorithm to search for signs of manipulation in the photos that are available. The AI flags a suspiciously smoothed, dithered patch in a 1969 image where earlier images are missing. The team frames that is circumstantial but intriguing E, it could be a clerical gap, but it could also indicate someone was intentionally masking a feature in the mid-1960s. The archival angle adds real historical context to the physical findings and amplifies the sense that there is a long, unexplained history at the site. Once Borehole 1 is cased successfully, the episode pivots to the carefully staged suite of downhole scans. Jan Frank runs a specialized ground, penetrating radar down the pipe, and produces a high-resolution scan showing a distinct off-axis object about 12 feet from the borehole and roughly 6 feet thick in cross-section. That image is visually striking in the episode A Clear, repeatable radar reflection sitting where the drill had struggled. Sam DeRiso's magnetometer sled returns strong magnetic spikes in the same depth band signifying anomalous magnetic materials that could be metal. And a gamma ray detector registered elevated counts in the same depth range. The simplest, most conservative interpretation the team offers is that there is a central, massive object that could be metallic and is surrounded by materials like the ceramic fragments they already found in the drilling spoils. The lab analysis sequence is an important, slower part of the episode where the team moves from field data to controlled tests. They take ceramic fragments to a university lab and run them through a scanning electron microscope, gas chromatography mass spectrometry, and atomic emission spectroscopy. The ACM experiment is odd and theatrical. The electron beam appears to open up holes in the ceramic surface while the beam is on, and then the structure seemingly reverts when the beam is off. That surprising response leads the team to clean, sonicate, and chemically process the samples. The ceramics float in dichloromethane, a weird physical property for a rock-like material, and then crush into dust much more easily than one expects given how those pieces seem to stop industrial drill bits in the field. The lab scenes are candid about what is and is not known the material behaves in ways that depart from normal ceramics, and that behavior warrants more study rather than simple explanation. The AES and elemental analysis are where the chemistry gets especially interesting. Tests reveal high amounts of titanium, iron, aluminum, calcium, and trace vanadium embedded in the ceramic matrix. Vanadium is a material used in aerospace and military alloys because of its strength and high temperature properties. Its presence in these samples is presented as notable because it's not typical of ordinary sandstone or local geology. The team is careful not to jump to C, Phi conclusions, but points out that finding vanadium plus high titanium and aluminum raises the possibility the ceramic is not a natural product, but rather an engineered material or a composite with embedded metal traces. The show handles this gently, see it offers the data, highlights the oddness relative to expected geology, and lets viewers draw their own inferences while promising more tests. One of the most provocative experiments at the lab is the Meissner effect test for superconductivity. Team members describe earlier observations 
where metal flakes popped away from a magnet and a ceramic piece initially stuck, but then repelled a magnet. To explore that, researchers cool a sample in liquid nitrogen and place it over a magnet to see if it will levitate. A classic demonstration of superconductivity. The episode treats the idea with the right mix of excitement and skepticism at superconductors are real materials, and they do show Meissner repulsion at low temperature. But modern superconductors usually require carefully controlled lab synthesis. The show doesn't overclaim a breakthrough. Instead, it presents the test and observes unexpected thermal behavior as the liquid nitrogen boils and takes longer than expected to stabilize. The experiment becomes another intriguing data point rather than proof of anything definitive. Throughout the episode, the team's approach is notable for its scientific discipline. They repeatedly cross, check data, use multiple independent instruments, avoid sensationalized narration, and consult outside experts. That process is on display when they discuss possible mundane explanations such as geological radioactivity, equipment artifacts, or anthropogenic contamination from past activities. The archiving mystery, the drill bit damage, the GPR and magnetometer spikes, the gamma hits on the downhole camera, and the odd lab chemistry all form a bundle of evidence that is interesting because it's multi-modal. Different kinds of measurements that converge on the same location and depth. That convergence is what moves this episode from merely curious to genuinely puzzling in a scientific sense. The ending of the episode is cautious and deliberately open. Rather than offer a sensational concluding claim, the team summarizes what they now know and lays out next steps DD more lab tests, follow, up drilling and instrumentation, and attempts to replicate signals under controlled conditions. They emphasize the practical work ahead, casing, additional downhole sensors, and more sophisticated elemental and isotopic analyses, and make a point of saying that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The final scenes underscore a sober scientific posture T, the ranch keeps providing weird data, and season 6 episode 12 shows the team narrowing in on a location that deserves serious follow, up rather than instant answers. If you're watching this episode and wondering what to take away, the best summary is this th the team discovered a repeatable mapped anomaly in the MESA that aligns across GPR, magnetometry, and gamma ray sensing. They recovered ceramic fragments that behave unusually in lab tests and contain metals often associated with engineered materials and historical cues like a 1964 nickel and a gap in aerial imagery at context that suggests this place has long attracted human attention. None of this, by itself, proves the wildest theories about the ranch, but together the pieces create a tightly knit investigative narrative that demands further study. The episode works well because it balances hands on field drama, the drilling, the stuck pipes, the near, welded bits, with careful lab work and cross, disciplinary interpretation. Finally, episode 12 is compelling because it models how serious field science responds to anomalies to stop, measure, cross, check, escalate tests, consult experts, and avoid premature conclusions. The episode leaves you with a compelling set of open questions and a clear promise that the next steps will be technical, expensive, and methodical. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, you have to respect that the team didn't slap a label on the data, but instead built a chain of measurements that point to something unusual. For viewers, the payoff is not a tidy reveal, but the sense that a genuine scientific mystery is unfolding and that the ranch might, at last, 
I'd be giving up something very strange inside the Misa.